I'm slightly allergic to the greasy foods lately. Okay, my name is Matt Holsenbeck. My research project explores the multifaceted topics involved in the debate about commercially inducing phytoplankton blooms with iron in order to sequester carbon dioxide in the oceans as a climate mitigation strategy. The problem that is fundamental to this project is anthropogenic climate change. This is caused mainly by human activities increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide that is one of the most effective greenhouse gases. Through the burning of fossil fuels, we are emitting almost 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. Atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations are currently at 380 parts per million, an increase of over 100 parts per million within the last 200 years. This concentration is higher than at any point in the last 650,000 years and causing a variety of effects on the planet's natural ecosystems. So as, as Bill would like to say, if you haven't heard of climate change or its effects, then thank you for crawling out from underneath your rock. Under the guidance of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United Nations adopted a treaty called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that had the goals of collectively reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the signing countries. The UNFCCC was signed on by over 160 nations, including the United States. It established greenhouse gas inventories for each country, determining how much they were emitting and also set up emission reduction targets for each country. The targets were not legally binding underneath the provisions of the treaty. Therefore, many scientists and politicians did not believe the UNFCCC would do enough to mitigate climate change. This led to years of discussion and the provision of the treaty called the Kyoto Protocol, which I'm sure you're familiar with. This set legally binding emission reductions for developed nations for the period of 2008 to 2012. Even though the United States did not sign on to this treaty, it persuaded the United Nations to include several flexibility mechanisms that made it more economical to achieve emissions reductions. The, fle the flexibility mechanisms that were implemented allowed countries that emitted less than their assigned amount to sell emission credits to other countries that exceeded their assigned amount. This meant this is meant to increase the uh, to decrease the cost effect or increase the cost effectiveness for the overall reduction in emissions through market-based strategies. The market-based system eventually led to the influence of the creation of regulated and voluntary carbon trading markets. It, is, uh, it also created the definition of carbon sink projects, which are projects that sequester carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and able to generate sellable emission reduction units to be used in carbon trading markets. The only carbon sink projects that are currently allowed underneath the, the Kyoto framework are reforestation and afforestation projects. Well, this is likely to change over time. Commercial interest in developing ocean iron fertilization as a carbon sequestration technique would have to sell their, uh, their credits within the smaller, but still substantial, voluntary carbon markets. Before we get to the commercial side of ocean iron fertilization, I'm going to introduce you to the star of the show, phytoplankton. To connect with you the importance of phytoplankton, I would like you all to continue breathing for the rest of this presentation. <laughs> Close to half of the oxygen you are using is produced by phytoplankton, so let's meet them. Marine phytoplankton is the general term for a group of microscopic autotrophic organisms that float freely in the, the upper mixed layers of the oceans. The first phytoplankton species to evolve was cyanobacteria over 3.5 billion years ago. They were the first species to be able to conduct photosynthesis and provide a major step in evolution. There are now over 2,400 species of marine phytoplankton that range in a variety of shapes and sizes as shown in this mosaic. Phytoplankton have several common features. They all have adaptations for maintaining buoyancy in the upper layers of the ocean called the photic zone so that they can conduct photosynthesis. They provide themselves with energy through the process of photosynthesis, which involves synth synthesizing carbon dioxide and sunlight into organic carbon that they store in their tissues. There are two types of photosynthetic reactions, the light reactions and the dark reactions, also called the Calvin cycle. The light reactions involve capturing sunlight energy with chlorophyll pigments to break down water and provide an electron transfer to the dark reactions while releasing oxygen. The dark reactions involve fixing inorganic carbon dioxide into organic carbon energy in the form of carbohydrates. Photosynthesis has an obvious role in regulating climate because it monitors carbon dioxide levels. Phytoplankton, like all plants, requires several key nutrients in order to grow and conduct photosynthesis. The major macronutrients they require are nitrogen, phosphorus, and silicon. Phytoplankton depend on the availability of these nutrients, and they are considered limiting nutrients when their absence limits phytoplankton population sizes. There are also several key micronutrients that are needed 
in very small amounts for phytoplankton growth. The most notable is iron. Phytoplankton use iron to synthesize chlorophyll pigments and photosynthetic electron transport proteins, as well as aiding in the uptake of other macronutrients like nit nitrate. Iron becomes insoluble when in contact with oxygen. And when phytoplankton evolved the oceans, it was rich in oxen, oxygen and deplete, or um, it was rich in iron, excuse me, and deplete in oxygen. But after three billion years, they increased oxygen and therefore decreased the available iron. So they got themselves in, in kind of a pickle. Um, phytoplankton used the essential nutrients and light conditions to create the primary productivity of energy in the oceans. They provide the basis for almost all marine food webs, and they are incredibly important species for all life on our planet. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the role of phytoplankton in the ocean carbon cycle. Carbon flows, flows through several major reservoirs, the biosphere, atmosphere, earth, and water. As you can see in this graph, the deep oceans are a major reservoir for the actively circulating inorganic carbon. The amount of inorganic carbon in the deep oceans is about 38,000 billion tons. That's a lot of tons. <laughs> Compared to the 750 billion tons in the atmosphere. The ocean and atmosphere exchange large quantities of carbon dioxide through several processes. The solubility pump is the most important abiotic factor or non-living factor for exchanging carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the oceans. The solubility pump involves a variety of factors in the lower atmosphere and oceans that determine the amount of carbon dioxide that is taken into the water. One of the most important factors is the total inorganic carbon in the oceans, and this is affected by biological factors. The biotic factors at play are the aspects of the biological pump. This is controlled by the amount of photosynthesis conducted by phytoplankton communities. Phytoplankton rapidly photosynthesize and store organic carbon in their tissues. Much of the organic carbon that is produced by phytoplankton is recycled in the upper layers of the oceans by remineralization from bacteria or heterotrophic consumption by their arch nemesis, zooplankton. The organic carbon that is remineralized by bacteria in the upper layers will become inorganic carbon and quickly release back into the atmosphere. But some large, fast-sinking particles of organic carbon are exported to deeper layers of the oceans, where they will remain out of contact with the atmosphere for much longer periods of time. If they reach depths of a thousand meters or more without being remineralized, they will stay out of contact with, or they will stay inside the water column for thousands to millions of years. The carbon dioxide that is exported will be replaced in the water column, column by the solubility pump, causing a net uptake of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Recent studies in the last several years have shown that the amount of carbon export below the photic zone that occurs during phytoplankton blooms can range from 20 to 50 percent of their total primary production. Studies in this field are very important to establishing if ocean iron fertilization will be an effective carbon sequestration technique. So the study of phytoplankton increased drastically with the advent of satellite imagery. And this map of net primary productivity was taken by NASA. I want you to notice the dark blue areas where little photosynthesis is, is being conducted, right near the poles and towards uh, in, in the northern Atlantic. These areas are called high nutrient, low chlorophyll areas of the oceans because they are abundant in the macronutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, but produce very little organic carbon. Their presence puzzled oceanographers for decades, and these areas are discussed in further detail in the iron hypothesis. So ocean iron fertilization, what is it? Ocean iron fertilization stemmed from the iron hypothesis developed by oceanographer Dr. John Martin. The iron hypothesis states that iron is a limiting micronutrient for phytoplankton growth and productivity in the high nutrient, low chlorophyll zones of the oceans. To test this hypothesis, Martin measured iron concentrations and conducted a variety of small experiments, but there were many skeptics because the tests were contaminated by small traces of other metals during the experimentation. Martin therefore proposed the first open ocean experimentation in history to support the iron hypothesis. He made plans